we we are going to start um, with our with our final uh, long paper of the day, um, and our speaker is Francisco Prado Vilar, who is director of cultural and artistic projects at Harvard's. Real Colegio Complutense and scientific director of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation program for the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. Um, he received his PhD from Harvard University and has subsequently held academic positions at Princeton University where he was a postdoctoral fellow in the Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts, the University of London, and the Complutense University in Madrid as Ramon y Cajal research professor where he directed the international project Medieval Art and European Culture, Classical Heritage, and Impact on the Discourses of Modernity. His research and publications have um, focused on diverse aspects of the arts and cultures of medieval Europe, um, covering topics with, of wide chronological, thematic, and methodological range. And today, he will be talking to us about the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. Please join me in welcoming Francisco. Well, thank you so much, Abby. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's wonderful to be here in this wonderful research institution and with, with these colleagues. Some of them uh, I haven't seen in a long time, so it's really beautiful to see in old mentor, no, young mentors also. <laughs> so, um, so today I'm going to talk about some of the discoveries that we've made in the context of this uh, project of research and conservation in the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela that started almost a decade ago. You know, if you went to Santiago, you probably suffered the scaffoldings that we put in place, covering especially the Western Front. And, um, but today, actually, uh, because the lecture is geared toward, towards ideology, I want to do a journey through the Cathedral of Santiago and discover what is royal in the cathedral, which, you know, when you think about it, you think about it as a, as a pilgrimage monument and not a royal cathedral. But in fact, the Western Front was conceived when uh, that thought was thought to be uh, the royal cathedral of the Leonese uh, monarchy. And also I wanted to put it in contact with other developments in the Mediterranean, not to draw like one-on-one -on -one parallel comparisons, but just to uh, create parallel journeys to think through and establish a methodological dialogue and, uh, and, and also analytical dialogue between monuments. So I wanted to start with, um, uh, I, I always love things that almost disappeared, but for some reason we still preserve them. And one of them is a, a, a beautiful poem in 100 lines entitled Aulae Sideria, Starry Halls, written for the consecration of the Church of St. Mary on Compiège, the, the Palatine Chapel of Charles the Bold, probably for the consecration of May 5th, 877, by John Scott of Ser Eugena. And it's one of the most beautiful ephrases on um, um, uh, a church that I know in the Middle Ages. The title comes from the first two words of the poem, Aula Sideria Parallelos Sundique Kirkos. So it's the, the, first, um, the first verses go like this. The torch of the sun binds everywhere with golden rays the concentric circles of the starry court. Twice does the, he balance on his scale a night, twice equal to the day, and twice he turns himself to the increase that each partakes. It goes on and on in a neoplatonic infused language of light and theology. And uh, at the end of the poem, in the last 17 lines, it describes actually the church itself from the point of view of the monarch who is looking at the beauty of the church from the royal tribune. And um, it compares it obviously with an uh, earthly image of the new Jerusalem, which is you know, the model that many churches in the Middle Ages had in mind, and architects had in mind for the effects of the churches. And he goes on saying, Charles, who builds wonderfully for you, the Virgin, 
a shining church, a chair constructed with a, with a variety of marble columns, and goes into a language of the, the precious materials and the quality, capitals, va vases, crafted roof, windows drinking in light through glass, pictures, pavements, steps, uh, and steps of stone everywhere, precious stones, gleams with gold, and ends with the materialization of the king who is looking at everything. The king himself, seated on a high throne, looks out at all, wearing on his exalted head the diadem of his fathers, his hand full of scepters, holding staffs of gold, a hundred may the great soul hero live long through the years to come. So I wanted to put together this, uh, this uh, image on parchment that has been related to a Scotus Eugena poem from the Codex Aureus of St. Emeran that showed Charles the Bold under this royal canopy overlooking something that is on the other page and we'll see in a moment but i wanted to put it together with the monument that will occupy me today which is seen from the nave that is the back part or the interior part of the west front of the cathedral of santiago the so-called portal of glory which is itself an narthex divided in three stories and that is the tribune a beautiful space that as we will see has um royal connotations. Uh, we don't preserve the, 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 the Church of St. Mary described by, by Eriugena in the poem, but it was probably similar for the description to the Palatine Chapel in Aachen, also with an octagonal uh, plan. And as I told you, scholars have uh, um, compare a little bit this double page of the Codex Aureus to what is described here, as if on one page, Charles was overlooking at probably the representation of what was in the dome of the church. So it's like a representation on parchment of this ethereal space. Also, it has to be, is, this, this codex has be, been linked to Eugena through the poems that it contains. But I want to start by tracing the, ge the royal genealogy or the conception of the Cathedral of Santiago as a royal monument from its beginning to its end, where we will end. In the beginning, as you know, the church was started here in 1075 in the chapels of the ambulatory. So the oldest part is, is the axial chapel de uh, dedicated to the Salvador. And it ended here in the three-story narthex built by Master Matthew around 1188, but finished around the 1200s. And we uh, will begin with what is the royal stamp on the cathedral from its foundation. And is this capital in the, in the axial chapel that has a sort of triumphal arch, and in one of the capitals, it represented King Alfonso VI of Castile, the founder of the church. On the other capital, Diego Peláez, the Bishop of Santiago, that was at the time. And here we have an eschatological portrait of the king, because he's represented in a eschatological perspective. His soul, or soul body, in this conception of the resurrection of the carnal body in the, in the Middle Ages, lifted, glorified by angels at the end of times. It's a prospective eschatological portrait of the king, of the glory he will attain because of his pious works, such as this cathedral. And we will end up with this capital, which is here, and you know where my argument is going to be, because this capital, as you see it, has remained cryptic in its iconography, until now, basically, because it's not, well, you know, I, I kind of, I, I explained this before, but it hasn't been published, and you, you see where I'm going, actually. So it will close the circle of the royal ambitions of the cathedral. But I'm going to start for the discoveries. See, this is what you see today, which is very related to what you, you, Eugena says in the poem, because you know, you have the cathedral covered with the scaffoldings in this spectral transformation of the monument, almost like something in between 
uh, the apparition of a dream like um, like a, um, a, a vessel from a otherworldly galactic perspective and something closer to performance art, something very medieval and something very modern. But in fact, this is the way probably cathedrals were perceived in the Middle Ages, and especially the Cathedral of Santiago, different times of the day, at the end of a road in which you, you basically have a different perception of the feelings of your body, your eyesight, your tactility, the elements, the weather. So today, actually, this transformed cathedral, which is not the static, uh, uh, gentrified image we have in photographs is closer to where I'm going to get of how this cathedral was transformed into into a, a, a royal monument. And here is what's inside, basically, the scaffolding. What's inside is obviously the uh, Baroque uh, facade of the cathedral. But the Baroque facade in itself is also a scaffolding, or a rather a, um, an envelope for the jewel, as if it was a shrine that contains inside, which is the Romanist facade, and specifically the Portal of Glory. And the scaffolding around it is part of the work of preservation of what's going on inside. And that preservation is bringing up new visions of what this monument meant, which are radically expanded from what it was thought to be before. Here you have a digital reconstruction of what is underneath this Baroque envelope. And there are substantial differences, because the image we have of the Portal of Glory today is basically the image of three arches. It's a bidimensional image, and that is radically different from how it was conceived, which was, which was an open narthex. It was open day and night until the 16th century when they built doors for the first time. So it was a continuation of the exterior space of the road that arrived in the cathedral. It was an open, enveloping, expansive space, a modern theatrical scenography in which they are where uh, you were basically surrounded by pseudo-living statues that dialogue among themselves and with you as you arrive, and you enter in the middle of a happening theater. And you just had to turn around, look, and be guided, in, oriented and disoriented in this, in this kind of like uh, virtual reality space that contains, uh, that catalyzes dynamism and effects. Obviously, we know, uh, because of the, the brilliant scholarship of Serafín Moralejo, that, uh, that the Portal of Glory was conceived as a materialization of the heavenly Jerusalem, trying to bring uh, into, into, into stone the images and the descriptions of the imaginary architecture of the Book of Revelation. And we know that in a crowd Crowthimerian also understanding of, uh, of architectural iconography because, as Moralejo pointed out, uh, through the iconography of the keystones in the, in the vaults, two of them at the earthly level sustaining a sun and a moon, and the other one, the Lamb of God, is an uh, uh, architectonical uh, uh, representation of the passage from the Apocalypse in which it says that the heavenly Jerusalem <coughs> does not need the sun and the moon to shine on it as the earth does, but it's lit by the only lamp, which is the lamp of God. So here you have exactly when you arrive at the cathedral, you are arriving at uh, what is represented here in a similar way in the, in the Gulbenkian Apocalypse, in which the angel brings St. John into a visionary representation of the heavenly Jerusalem. Here also represented in a vertical way, exactly the same as the words from of the Cathedral of Santiago. Here you see how in this other representation of the heavenly Jerusalem, the same Saint John, bring, uh, the angel bringing Saint John, is represented actually as almost the facade of a cathedral, such as the one we have in Santiago. And again, the Lamb of God is on the top, exactly like the Santiago 
Lamb of God in the keystone of the Tribune. This is, as you, as you see, Tutankhamun's tomb. No, it's not. <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually... <laughs> It's actually a Galician octopus, no, that could be. No, it's actually the vault of the Tribune of the third story of the Portal of Glory. And you can imagine what's underneath there. And what's underneath there is the Lamb of God. Here, in a wonderful piece of performance art, the unveiling of the mystic Lamb is almost coming out of like a Carolingian Bible, of the Muntier Grabal final page. It's actually quite, quite a great piece of performance art. And you see the beauty and the, 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 the entity as a sculptural product of the Lamb of God, of the, this, this keystone that if we see it from far away, it seems like a, a relief. And when you are there, it's like a huge piece of sculpture. And also the scaffolding allows us to understand closer the, the material, uh, creation and the, mm, the phenomenological and theological effects of some of the architectural features, such as the wonderful oculus that connects the space of the trivium with the interior nave, which is also an incredible piece of minimalist sculpture that could be at the MoMA or in some other museums of modern art. It's quite something. But it allows us also to understand the connections, not only like the connections that Moralejo drew vertically in the understanding of the Portal of Glory, but the Portal of Glory was conceived by Master Matthew in connection horizontally with some, uh, with another of his masterpieces created in conjunction with the Portal of Glory and to function, function with it iconographically and from the perspective of light and space and theological understanding of this mystical vessel, which is the cathedral, which is the uh, stone choir. Ma many parts of it are still preserved and this is a digital reconstruction. And you see how there is a connection in which at some point during the day, the light hits on the facade of the stone choir where there was here a representation of the adoration of the Magi and the Virgin in the tympano as said the Sapienta in, in herself, like a, a, a church within the church, within the church, because the, you know, the stone choir also represented a model of the heavenly Jerusalem. So you have a Russian doll involving situation in which you see, you immerse yourself into many materializations of the heavenly Jerusalem. And obviously the exterior facade is fascinating. We preserve to this, I, I, will, uh, I will devote more time, part of it, and we see this cosmic element to it in which you have this wonderful oculus and part of the central arch, which was a masterpiece because it was an arch open in a width of seven meters. It, wa it was one of the great masterpieces of the Portal of Glory, this incredible, gate of of light that allowed to f to light flooding into the nave and you see obviously something that i will comment here this almohad kind of and this allows us also uh, to understand how we cannot uh, see you know when in traditional scholarship you see this oculus is the typical analysis geometric patterns decorative patterns but these patterns where uh, were designed to transform themselves with light, to play with light. And when they play with light, we realize that it's not a decorative pattern. It's supposed to become the interior flames of, of an apocalyptic sun, exactly such as the ones represented in the tradition of this, the representation of this very important passage in the book of Revelation, which is the materialization of the woman dressed uh, with the sun and, uh, and the moon under her feet and the child, which is an image of the Virgin Mary in the book of Revelation. And here, uh, this is a stage for Mary to reveal herself in a scatological perspective. Exactly the earlier passage of Revelation we will be looking at is represented in the exterior facade. And here is a beautiful image because 
outside there was this incredible rose window which is itself, as you know, an image of Mary in the theology of the mid 12th century as Mary is speaking of the virginity of Mary, you know, the light that goes through glass without breaking it. So you have like this theological image of Mary, then her eschatological screen for mystical projections and offering as a stage for for uh, a f to develop a visionary perspective with light. And where does Mary hit? Through here, all the way to the tympanum of the choir, where Mary herself is dressed in color, is dressed by the sun, literally. And this was a polychrome sculpture. So you have here, when you look back, different materialization of Mary within the realm of the church. Of course, what I just said totally kind of destroys these labels you have about Romanesque, Gothic, light, uh, darkness, static elements. I mean, this is something that is the portal of glory as the masterpiece that it is, that transcends labels, and it suffered a lot from the, the, the labels that uh, sometimes we keep using in our history because those labels prevent people to look at the actual, the actual uh, monument. As you can imagine, what I just said is a, a, is a crime to call this late Romanesque. I mean, <laughs> I mean, really, uh, you know, what is late about this? I mean, it's like, <laughs> and what is early about some of the early Gothic cathedrals? I mean, it's just ridiculous. You know, it's that type of thing that. In the second decade of the 21st century, we should just get, a, get away with it because it prevents pre people, people from looking and it diminishes the value of a monument and the importance of the monument in the context of our history. Here is another perspective that completely changed the perception of the monument. And that is what the scaffoldings allow. We are looking at here. Here is what you see when you are standing in the portal of glory. And this is the amazing sculptures hanging in the rebolts of the, of the vaulting. They are amazing. I mean, they are masterpieces because they are all different. I mean, they didn't spare imagination work for places that you would never see. All the leaves are different. All the pine cones are different. And obviously, they are not pine cones. This again, like the oculus, they are thought to be perceived underneath and they are created for their beauty and for an absolute feat of, of prowess in sculpture and design, uh, but also for the effect that they create. And as, as you can see, I mean, this is another for a display in a museum, one of them, which are like dots when you are looking at them from underneath. As Rocío Sánchez Ameijeras has correctly explained, and for other comparative material, these are falling stars, like the falling stars of the f the, uh, that fall when the fifth angel sounds uh, his trumpet. And uh, you see all the angels in the portal of glory that are actually uh, starting the upheaval, the cosmic upheaval, which is captured there in stone for you when you arrive uh, with the play of light and polychromy, all this cosmic upheaval of the end of times just, mm, just starts happening around you. You are basically immersed in the book of Revelation as it is happening in this stage. Uh, I just threw this foliage. Let's, let's put it that, that one, right? <laughs> and no comment, no comment at this point. But another thing that is missing is obviously the polychromy. If what I just said kind of gives you a completely more dynamic vision of the monument, much more so when we think about the monument as if it was originally perceived through polychromy. Here you have some of the people, uh, the teams of, of conservators working in the portal of glory. And here I put this because these are my Melon Fellows. This is Livio Ferrazza. He has a Melon Fellowship for the Santiago Cathedral Project. And here is Enas Hansa, one of the Melon Fellows. 
and you know they are they are already celebrities and can hardly talk to them since they they you know they are on the covers of magazines it's like i'm they are beyond my reach but the fact is that they are here you have just a moment when this is the self-portrait of the artist in the portal of glory looking towards the nave right this is a moment in which he's been cleaned with hydrogels developed with nanotechnology also research done in the context of the santiago cathedral project this happened like a month ago basically but one of the things that this the the I, i'm going to go really fast through this we we've been able to determine the sequence of five major polychromies applied to the portal of glory in during the centuries and the interesting thing obviously uh, it comes as no surprise uh, that the first polychromy was unbelievable and unbelievably expensive made of high purity gold and lapis lazuli which is the most expensive material that you can have but not only that they use that extensively in such a huge monument is that they didn't spare anything for example in the well here you see actually you know you can hear through these microscopes when it's quite quite astounding when you actually you don't see anything in the stone and you go with one of these electronic uh, microscopes and there is gold everywhere that you can see here and here the same in the famous a statue of, of St. James in the Trumeau. This is a reconstruction of the polychromy based on the, uh, on the traces of polychromy. But here, if you are in the 24 elders of the apocalypse, which are masterpieces of sculpture in their own right, and they are high up, close to the vault as we saw, they didn't spare to apl in applying thick layers of lapis lazuli in the back. I mean, that is like basically throwing gold all over the place just, you know, for the sake of it. It's incredible. And that gives you a sense of the royal investment in this portal of glory, right? Here you have, I mean, all the traces of different polychromies. Then the second polychromy, I won't get into it. The third one is amazing. It's with applied brocades. It's a Renaissance polychromy, Flemish. Uh, it became the portal of glory like a Flemish painting, basically. like like you know the Gant altarpiece basically and um but i'm going to go through the facade because the facade is the key point this one in the one that this facade replaced to understand the cathedral of santiago as a royal monument and one of the things that i've been able to do is provide the first complete reconstruction of the iconographic program of the exterior facade of the portal of glory identifying every one of the sculptures that had been dismantled in the from the 16th to the 18th century and are now in museums and private collections and this had been either misidentified or non-identified at all i identified them all including a very important one that I talked to uh, about it um, at the end, and, it's, uh, and we've been able to reconstruct the program. And this is like almost like discovering a monument that did not exist, and that is a key monument in the history of art, which is the exterior portal of the Portal of Glory. It's not a question of, okay, we have one more prophet. No, it completely changes the perception of the meaning and the effects and the conceptual sophistication as a space and as a monument of this this world two of the most important one here you see them in the 1940s in these photographs of the marble archives at, as part of a lapidary and here you see them for who they are and where they were they were in the jams of the of the main uh, uh, arch uh, which they were taken out when the doors were fitted there in 1520 and they are these amazing characters Enoch and Elijah the witnesses of the apocalypse the two characters that basically come to earth to announce that the second coming is happening anytime soon telling the people in the city to repent then they are killed by the antichrist and then they resurrect three days later and they are the first kind of resurrecting, anticipating the, a little bit the resurrection of the humans at the end of time, you know, the, the resurrection of the flesh. 
and there are here there are very important characters in the tradition of the commentaries of the apocalypse in the middle ages in spain here you you have them in in one of the beatus elias and enoch and here they are wonderfully placed in that role this different role that they have elijah is like furious even spitting uh fire through the mouth saying everyone to repent and elijah was actually looking out into the city into into the place where the town people should wa be warned and then enoch is the one that looks at heaven you know that anticipates what you will see at the end of time and here enoch is looking inside at the second coming of christ which is the next chapter in the book of revelation so when you arrive in santiago suddenly you get into the narrative sequence in which the space and your movement becomes narrative sequence and you go as in a video game through different pantallas as we do as we say in spain you know through different screens and you arrive and you are greeted by the witnesses of the apocalypse and you enter and that is what happens the upheaval of the second coming of christ here you have them also in this wonderful representation of the liver floridos uh again the angel giving saint john the rod to measure the temple the temple represented like a cathedral and here enoch and elijah on the door and the, the, i mean master matthew doesn't do here any iconographical invention they appear in the of the of the of the kings and you see here uh, actually a style very similar to the style of the images from the portal of glory but we were able to analyze also the pigments in the tumbos with different uh, uh, um, uh, machines for measurement and uh, and uh, and there is a connection between the pigments of the portal of glory and what was being doing in the tumboa so this gives you an idea of the royal investment and this royal connection between the tumbos and what they represent as the memory of the kings in the royal cathedral in the portal of glory but i want to go back a little bit to where the portal comes from and the portal comes from another enigma in the history of art in the history of the cathedral of santiago which is the the facade that was there before the portal of glory if there was any facade and you know the facade is described in the famous uh, book five of the codex calistinus that contains this famous description of the city and the cathedral and the author of the codex calistinus written about 1140 not earlier um describes the facades of the transept which were built about 1105 1110 um, and when he goes into the description of the western facade he says it's unbelievable i mean it's larger than the rest more beautiful than the rest it contains the transfiguration of the lord but it's a very generic uh, uh, description in relation to the description of the transept portals so some some have argued that the portal of glory was built when this facade was not built and basically the description of the of the of the codex calistinus was a description of um, a kind of project that was not never realized but there are grounds to think that it had been realized obviously the transfiguration was a very important theme for santiago because it was the the moment in which christ reveals himself as god to his favorite disciples among them saint james so it was saint james saint peter and saint john so automatically put saint james there in a in an important position and in fact in the dedication of the the three the, the chapels in the cathedral of santiago in the ambulatory it reproduces a transfiguration on uh, on the plan of the cathedral here you have the salvador saint john saint peter and here obviously the altar of saint james so it's a transfiguration in abstract in the plan of the cathedral so it's so beautiful the cathedral started with a transfiguration and ended up with a figural transfiguration as it was conceived but in fact some of the sculptures that were put on the southern oh my god 
Are you serious? <laughs> anyway, let me just go fast. Belong to a transfiguration that probably was in the in the main portal. Here you have Saint James, and it says that uh, the inscription says that it is Saint James in Monte, so is Mount uh, Tabor where the transfiguration took place. And here you have also transfigurato Jesu. So probably these two images belong to a transfiguration that was at some point or maybe thought to be put in the unfinished western portal the important thing is that in this transfiguration there is the fir a reference to the first um, coronation that took place in the cathedral of santiago here it says amphus rex and that is probably referring to this idea that the archbishop helmiret had in the 1110 the archbishop that built basically the transit portals of the cathedral to transform the cathedral into a stage for coronations and to uh, create there the seat uh, for the saint denis and the rhine the reigns of the leonese monarchy and it was this amazing event that is described in the historia compostelana in which in uh, 1111 Alfonso VII, the son of Queen Urraca, uh, when he was still a child, he's crowned in the cathedral by the bishop himself, sitting the, the child on the episcopal throne, he's crowned and anointed with a scepter, and then he, there is a banquet, and that is the first big coronation. Several other things related to Alfonso VII, from that point on in the charters he appears as, together with his mother, as king and queen uh, of Leon. Here um, there are many other events for when this inscription could have been made. There is um, a reception of a parade that is described profusely in the Codex Calistinos in which they enter to celebrate the victory all by the Almoravids. And it's described and they arrive at the cathedral in 1117. It could be at that point that Amphus Rex is put there, but it could be also in 1124 when there is a very important nighting ceremony for the King Alfonso VII in the cathedral when he uh, Helmirez, the Archbishop, um, basically gets from him the uh, promise that he will be buried in the Cathedral of Santiago, establishing there a royal pantheon, which was very important. So at that point, probably, is when this Amphus Rex was put there. And probably at that point, already the western front of the cathedral was thought as, ta as a scenography to mix transfiguration and this eschatological idea of Leon's kinship with biblical character uh, that will be taken over by the portal of glory. What happened later is that Alfonso VII abandoned uh, basically Santiago. He ended up uh, being crowned emperor in Leon, so Santiago was abandoned. And so this idea of creating a royal cathedral there with the death of Helmirez and some problems that the see had in the, ra the race of Toledo as the seat for the monarchy, uh, this, this plan in the mid 12th century was abandoned. But later on, Fernando II actually re reused, uh, I mean, basically linked again the project of, of transforming the cathedral into a royal monument, establishing a royal pantheon. And this is the moment in which, in this uh, privilege, he entrusted uh, Master Matthew in 1168 to finish the cathedral. And that is the moment when they dis dismantle whatever was built of the western facade and they create the portal of glory with the idea of transforming a pilgrimage place into a royal cathedral, into Reims. In 1188, Master Matthew signs. Uh, here we have uh, 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 Alfonso IX, his son is also buried there, and he obviously is the last king of the independent Leonese uh, kingdom, and that is why after that Toledo, again with the, with the union of Castile and Leon, will be the place for the monarchs and Santiago will be abandoned. That is why the portal of glory had 
was really short-lived as a stage in scenography for coronations. And this is the last, the last amazing sculpture that has been recently identified. It's in a private collection, and it's unbelievable. I mean, it's so beautiful. The conception of the folds, the conception of the feet, uh, I mean, just, I was so struck when I entered the dining hall of this now friend of mine in his country state, and I found this. Uh, I mean, it's just beautiful. And the, and the, uh, the, the sword, it's like coming out of like Game of Thrones, no? <laughs> like to put like some pop culture. And it's very related to the feet of actually one of the funerary sculptures in the Royal Pantheon. But what it is, uh, I have no doubt, is the first monumental representation of St. James as Miles Christi. Here you have, at the moment in which in 1170, Fernando the, s the, the second, yes, the second, <laughs> Fernando the second establishes the order of St. James. Obviously his son is knighted, uh, Alfonso the ninth in the Cathedral of Santiago, knighted, knight of the order of St. James, when the monumental facade was being built. And here it is, the first monumental representation of St. James, collapsing in the image of the sword, the representation of St. James in some of the early Gothic ensembles with the sword of his martyrdom, because he was uh, decapitated, but here acquiring also a kind of idea of the sword of the, um, of the Knights of St. James. And in fact, the sword was their emblem in their capes. So here you have, as you can see, the sword is the main part of the whole, the whole sculpture. And here, obviously, this is the first, what was thought to be the first representation of St. James as Moore's layer in the clavijo tympanum later in the 13th century. But now we have here the first one, the first one, which was supposed to be, I think, here in the crypt of the Portal of Glory. And I will go very fast, um, but I just wanted to, sh to follow a little bit how this, this scenography function. And we have uh, this incredible manuscript from a century later, from Alfonso the Ninth, 19th ceremony. It belongs to Alfonso the Eleventh at the beginning of the 14th century. It's called the Coronation Book of the Kings of Castile. And it's an unfinished manuscript. Some of the miniatures are left unfinished, but it's beautifully illuminated in other parts. And this is an order of coronation, a protocol for a coronation ceremony that copies a Roman order, but it's a ceremony that su was supposed to take place in the Cathedral of Santiago but never took place, only in the manuscript, because then Alfonso XI was crowned in Las Huelgas. But the wonderful thing is that we have the manuscript. And here uh, we see the sequence of events. The bishops and the canons go to the, to the walls of the city, to the gates, and receive the royal entourage. They go through the city with the, 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 the sword of the nighting ceremony up, and uh, throwing coins. And here is the king, and here is the seneschal of the king with the knighting sword. And they enter through this, door, th through this uh, gate, and they come here, right? And then here, they uh, get, get, get off the horse? Is there a, 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 a verb? Dismount. They dismount quite similar, actually, to what you imagine the Magi dismount, right? When they go to Jerusalem, there is always display. And there is when the king and the people with the big sword for the nighting ceremony dismount at the earthly level, the lower level of the portal of glory, and they find face to face their model. St. James as Miles Christi, which is what they would become. So the real sword of the 19th ceremony would meet the Ur sword, right, of St. James. And there they enter this uh, space of the crypt, which is the earthly space, which would be kind of like polyvalent space, where while the bishops go inside and change robes, uh, 
disentourage weights there, maybe th with a kind of like, this was also an open space, purification of the elements for the liturgy and, and the elements for, for like the sword itself. And here he would find some elements like this ascent of Alexander, like um, metaphorical ideas for a king of what the limits that he should have in the exercise of power, like the famous flight of Alexander, which is an idea of, you know, basically don't try to reach heaven with your earthly powers. Then the, the whole entourage would go up the stairs, the king of Leon would pass by these two sculptures of David and Solomon, his ancestors, uh, in the royal lineage of the kings, and they, they will meet the bishop and he will basically have an oath in the portal of glory. And there, in the portal of glory, he would meet the genealogy of the tree of Jesse, again, David, Solomon, the genealogy of Christ, which is also the genealogy and the models for the kings of Leon. And the, f the portal of glory is full of coronations everywhere. Everyone is crowned. I mean, the, the, the faithful, there are crowns everywhere. The coronation is pervasive there. And there he would meet at an, an anti-model. As Manuel Castineiras has brilliantly observed, what we have here in these amazing sculptures is the representation of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. So there will be two, three metaphors. The good tree, the genealogy of the kings, uh, of the rightful kings of Israel, and the bad kings that don't know their limits. And obviously what you have here is Nebuchadnezzar, like in the Roda Bible, like among the beasts. And you know the dream. He dreams of a big tree, and then, you know, um, he thinks that he's all powerful, and God, you know, like makes him dream this, this dream of a tree that from where all the animals feed, and the tree gets uh, at some point, how do you call it, uh, torn down, chopped off. And then God tells him, sends a curse, and tells him, you will live with the animals, sing it like an animal, and here you have him. So again, see, and here's the representation. I, I, I love this one from the Cardenia Beatus. A Beatus, by the way, very close to the portal of glory in, in a style. Ubi Nabucodonosor Herbas Pakens. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, and here you have them. So again, showing the king the good elements and the bad. And the king keeps, keeps going with the entourage. And here you have how amazingly the portal of glory works with the name. Here in the, at the top of the tree of Jesse, you see an annunciation. So this annunciation is temporarily connected to the next stage, which is the adoration, down the nave, here. So if you keep walking, you keep also, yeah, and I finish. And I finish uh, with the Tribune, where we started. This is the last, uh, the last miniature of the coronation ceremony, the Book of Coronation, which is unfinished, but it's good enough. I mean, and it, it says how in the Tribune of the cathedral, they build a kind of like wooden, uh, how do you call it, stage, for the king and the queen. And there are arguments, Carrero, for example, thought that this tribune could be on the transept of the cathedral. Rodri uh, Rocio Sanchez puts the, the, this, this uh, stage here in the royal tribune of the Portal of Glory, which is where it should be. And here is like a cosmic space. It's almost like the Aula Sideria of Eriugena. And it's a cosmic space related to gold, and it's like this is from the Capella Palatina. And this is, I'm going to go back to the beginning, because what we have here is exactly the portrait of the Leonese kings that ended the cathedral with his going back to the great grandfather of the beginning of the cathedral in a scatological perspective. So why no one has understood this? Because it's a 1075 iconographic model represented in the style of the 1200s. 
I mean, he's establishing a dialogue. There is no catalog of iconography in the 1200 that can tell you. But what you have here is the same. Is this image of the of the soul royal king with the with the apparition of the angels pointing upwards? And here is like a beautiful sculpture. The angels here pointing up. And here is exactly what we have, closing the cathedral. And the royal dimension to the portal of glory, which is similar to the resurrection. I mean, the, what in the portal of glory looks like vegetation is usually cosmic elements or elements related to, to the way the, the phenomenon of, of apparitions of, of sacred elements. And here you have the coronations. And here you have another of from the pavement of the of the Capella Palatina, and here we just finished from where we started. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.